from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today to celebrate books and the joy of reading. I'm Gigi Dixon, Senior Vice President and Director of Strategic Partnerships for Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is a proud, very proud sponsor, and we're proud to have been here for six years as a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. As in years past, we have fun exhibits for you to experience, so if you haven't been there yet, please make your way to the exhibits. Please be sure to check out our Let's Read America Pavilion, where we're featuring hands-on history, offering the opportunity to pan for goal, and yes, lasso a pony, as well as the chance to tell your personal story in the My Untold exhibit, and the opportunity to climb into a Wells Fargo stagecoach. Wells Fargo is committed to making a real difference in education by maintaining an active involvement in our public education system, arguably the most important institution in our country. We believe financial success begins with a foundation of strong reading and math skills in early education. Jackie Kennedy, a former first lady, said it well. There are many little ways to enlarge your child's world. Love of books is best of all. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Marcia Davis, editor of the Washington Post Magazine. Thank you. So welcome everyone to this wonderful afternoon with Margot Jefferson. Um, let me start by saying I'm not the editor of the magazine, but I am an articles editor of the magazine, one of three. And I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. People do that all the time. Um, and I'm just so excited to be here for many reasons. And we have a very joyous afternoon because today is the opening day of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And that day is made far more bountiful by spending the afternoon with Miss Jefferson. Um, oh, you can? I thought. I, hello, can you hear me now? I feel like that Verizon guy who's like switched to Sprint or something right now. <laughs> so, um, Miss Jefferson um, is the wonderful author of the 2015 memoir, Negro Land. And uh, she is also um, a former arts critic uh, for the New York Times and Newsweek, and is also now the uh, a writing instructor at Columbia University School of the Arts. She is, you may know, also a Pulitzer Prize winning author for her criticism. And um, you may also know uh, the author of a very interesting piece of work about Michael Jackson, uh, who in my preteen years was my adorable, handsome fantasy man. He was singing to me, only me, when he was crooning. <laughs> so, so we're very happy to be here um, and to welcome Margot Jefferson. So, the way this will work is we will talk for about 25 minutes or so, and then there'll be time for the audience to jump in and to ask questions. And why don't we just start? I'd like to start by talking about the Museum of African American History and Culture. I know you haven't seen it, but from the outside. except from the outside. <laughs> uh, but what is it that, uh, do you think that this museum will make a difference in this country? On, now can, ah, bliss, all right. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. All right, um, it's, there are so, this represents an entirely new stage 
multi-platform world for um, African American history. There are so many stages that just, in my life, um, I've lived through my parents who were born in the early 20th century, 1908 and 1916. They were of the generation of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, um, founded by Carter G. Woodson. It was very meticulous and scrupulous, groundbreaking history. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois was part of this. It was segregated history, meaning very few people other than black scholars and blacks wanting to be educated really knew about it. It, it mirrored in that way a segregated nation. Um, when I came along in the, I was born at the end of the 40s, um, I went to a quite progressive school, which was largely white, so we got little bits of black or even African history, but basically tiny little injections. I was getting basically, you know, white canonical history, and my parents at a certain point began to worry that I, in fact, needed remedial black history lessons, uh, you know, because being in an integrated world, mm -hmm. I wasn't getting the history they had gotten um, in grammar school, etc. College was the era, I was in college in the mid and late 60s, of black studies um, and ethnic studies, African American studies, you know, and now, um, but, you know, still they were controversial, you know, these programs had to work to establish themselves. Now to see this kind of um, given, um, the acceptance, the claiming of it, and the entitlement, you know, that this is a major, this is not footnote, this is not special interest, as um, conservatives often like to say about minorities and women, special interest. Um, you know, this is major American history um, in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you. Your book um, won the National, Books, the National Book Critic Circles Award for Autobiography. And you titled it Negro Land. Mm -hmm. And that is an interesting title. And it almost seems as a, another country exactly. inside a country. Exactly. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how you came to name the book that. Gladly. And you, you said it exactly right. I wanted that sense of a, another country. James Baldwin, um, within a country, a separate and yet overlapping land. I chose the word Negro because capitalized, it was the honored and preferred term, as I'm sure people of an older generation in this audience know. Um, for basically early 20th century um, to the mid to late 60s, the Harlem Renaissance talked about the new Negro. Mm -hmm. um, the New York Times began capitalizing it. This was a big fight in the 30s. But that was the honored word during my coming of age years. And I wanted to use that as a way of helping recreate um, the culture of um, being a Negro. And in the world I was in, which was the um, Negro um, haute bourgeoisie, which called itself, liked to call itself an upper class or an elite, um, you know, being a Negro meant, it's what people call respectability politics today, mm -hmm. trying to be a perfect emblematic, um, emblematically intelligent, dignified representative of your race. And this went you know, into everything from your speech patterns to your manners to, in fact, in my, in my Chicago version of, the, of that world, having decent um, race politics, you know, advancing the race. Um, so all I wanted to capture those rituals, that tone. Um, land is an interesting word because lands have their own culture, each land, which we did as American Negroes, but lands are also bordered by others, sometimes hostile lands. And, mm -hmm. you know, the very segregated world of Chicago contained various kinds of black life, all bordering on and often menaced by um, white lands, if you will. So what I'm curious as a writer, um, 
when, you, when is it that you decided to write this memoir? And how long were you writing it before you actually committed words to paper? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. You are an editor, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so your first one is, when did I begin? Decide. Decide. Yeah. All right, um, you know, often when you're a writer, you know, you're going about your business. Like some people, you're turning out books. I was turning out articles. But, you know, material keeps building up. And as particularly my parents got older, and as I, you know, got through my rebellions and began to trust myself in relation to them, every time I visited Chicago, their world became more and more interesting to me because I could bring an adult person and writer's eye to it and look back at all, look at all the rituals and manners and ways and expressions they were carrying on, um, you know, and realize, oh my God, you know, mm -hmm. this has to be preserved, this is fascinating. Um, is Isabel Wilkerson captures that, you know, all that so well in, in her book, The Warmth of Other Sun, so many ways of talking, thinking, um, dressing. Uh, so that's, I think, when it started. Probably I started taking notes in the 70s or 80s, but wow. did not at all yet commit myself, commit my imagination or my consciousness to a book. Um, in not until the 2000s, really, did I decide I have to do this. Um, Zora Neale Hurston has a great line about, um, she's talking about needing to tell a story as a writer, and she says there's the Roman legend of the boy um, who um, there was like a wolf gnawing at his entrails, and that's what happens when a story for a writer can't come out. So I, I started to feel acutely uncomfortable, and I would get angry and jealous when other writers were turning out memoirs or novels um, that I thought they can, they're expressing something. I'm not. Um, and then, frankly, in 2008, I got a grant for it, and then my sister, who was three years older than I, and the director of the Alvin Ailey School, yeah. my sister got cancer, and I thought, I have to, you know, I, I have. It, it, often life gives you a kind of urgency. I thought, I have to record everything I can mm -hmm. while she's alive, but also, you know, because I don't know how long any of them will live. Right. Yeah. What it, so was she able to see any part of your book? She saw part of it, yes. She didn't see the whole, and she helped a lot. You know? oh. Siblings, relatives, you have different kinds of memory. And she had, she had very acute sense memories. Um, and also just things to compare right. against. So right. that was good. Right. And my mother, my father died first. My mother is incredibly sharp and witty, and I was constantly, I'd be on the phone with her, and I'd be <laughs> typing down her, her, wit, her witticisms. Right. Right. So when we, you know, you've taken us into this, country, this second country in our country um, of the black elite, the black bourgeoisie, and the geography, the map you draw of the geography is very intimate, uh, very detailed, and also very painful. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and, and how you feel about it now. Well, you know, to this business of belonging to um, the so-called elite um, of a discriminated against to oppressed group is very peculiar. Um, you certainly, you're a, you're a fool um, and you're a liar if you do not acknowledge that you are sheltered and privileged um, in many ways where I think the pain um, and the came uh, is, you know, it's, the, it's partly the old W.E.B. Du Bois double consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, we were constantly um, living out and living up to all of the accomplishments and achievements um, of black people, of Negroes, and that's where we did know um, or were taught black history. At the same time, we knew perfectly well that if we did not prove in terms of our manners, our accomplishments, our cultural references, that we were as good as white people, which in a clear way meant being like white people, um, then we were flopping. 
Uh, that leads both to self-consciousness and a struggle with um, self-hatred. Yeah. And that was very difficult. Also, there was a kind of self-scrutiny, particularly for girls, um, I would say. You know, this constant surveillance and watching of, um, are my manners good enough? Am I a lady? We were, as girls, we were busy combating. We had been taught the history of the black women, which included, you know, we've been raped. Many white people think we weren't even raped. We were just loose and slatternly um, on the plantations and after, you know, we don't really have minds. We're just lusty, sexy creatures. All of those stereotypes were still circulating um, in the, for, you know, through the whole, through most of the 20th century. They only started changing in the late 60s. So, you know, that, those kinds of history, uh, histories are hanging over you when you go out to eat in a restaurant, when you sit down in a schoolroom, you know, when any time you enter um, any part of the white world. At the same time, you know, you are fighting that self-hatred by um, honoring um, black, black people uh, and their history. And yet, because of class prejudice, you are also cultivating real kinds of snobbery, as every haute bourgeoisie is taught to do. I tried so. to dress really nice for you today. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I do. And you look very nice, <laughs> Thank indeed. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Go on. You are so nice. No. So it's that kind of um, uh, self-consciousness, the struggle between pride and self-hatred, and the struggle between um, honor and um, snobbery, I would say. I think it's key. And con consciousness, you know, black power was a big struggle for the black, <laughs> for right. the Negro elite. Uh, right. Not so much for my generation. We were thrilled to seize it. But um, nevertheless, it felt like you had to remake yourself entirely. All of the, the internal scrutiny, um, I wonder about what it was like as a child. One of the things that I found rather sad is the pressure for children to figure this out and to navigate the world of race in these two worlds in which they live yeah. it seemed very challenging. And also the struggle for parents, for African-American parents, the whole idea of preserving innocence as long as you can. I wonder if you could talk about that. There for is. Your, and comparing it to now, do you still oh. see the remnants of that? Ooh. Uh, you know, every, I'm wondering if I can find this passage from the wonderful black historian and writer, James Weldon Johnson, where he describes exactly the um, pressures. Well, I don't want to spend huge amounts of time looking for it, but his, he says for every Negro parent, and he's writing this in the 30s, there is this battle, internal battle, between keeping a child you know, innocent enough to feel confident about moving through the world, and yet, if you are a black child, making sure you know enough about prejudice. We see this played, played out, acted out, in, in, you know, in terms of the police brutality cases all the time when parents say, when am I going to tell my son? You know, um, don't do this. Well, there, there are also, you know, plenty of other things parents are worrying about telling um, a black child. So, you know, that balance is always, do you tell too little? Do you tell too much? Do you tell it too soon? And um, James Walden Johnson has a, a chilling line. He says, either way, if you go too far either way, it can spell spiritual disaster for the child, you know, which is psychologically as well as sociologically um, profound. And every generation of uh, black parents inherits what their parents did or didn't and didn't do with them and then has to renegotiate it according to the historical and sociological circumstances. Um, I was not, uh, my sister and I, we were very protected in that world in many ways. We were not physically threatened. Um, what our parents had to navigate um, you know, were things like 
it's in the book. Well, we go to, we're on a vacation, we go to a hotel um, in Atlantic City. They suddenly can't find the reservations. Um, my father says, Dr. Jefferson, the hotel clerk keeps saying, Mr. Jefferson, I can't find it. Mm. Finally, we get shown to an egregious room. <laughs> and my sister and I still don't get it. My parents, you know, are, they don't want to tell us, but they are letting us know we're leaving tomorrow. It's a prejudiced hotel. The bathtub is dirty. Um, there are those kinds of things. Um, also, we had to navigate and integration. Um, and by the time especially you get, you know, do you do play dates? Now this is the 50s, so let's not forget in the 50s, the Brown versus Board of Education right. is just happening. Um, so, you know, these little worlds of this or that private school or public school, the private ones were more sheltered. They were, everyone was feeling their way. Um, so yeah, do you do play dates? When you do, are you reading that the mothers are really not comfortable with each other? And what do you make of that? Um, when adolescence comes, the whole question of interracial dating comes up. And you know, the parents, all parents have to decide, I don't want my black child to be hurt or belittled or exoticized, but that child has a, is going to be doing and thinking and experimenting with things I, the parent, did not. And they must have room you know, to move into the world as it changes. Mm -hmm. That is still going, going on, of course. You know, life, um, of, well, you know, it depends, on, it depends on where you are and how much, you know, money and access um, and uh, privilege in terms of schools, neighborhoods, um, the black parents we're talking about have, mm -hmm. actually. I can't give one answer to that question, but the negotiations, of course, are still continuing. You write, your book has been called and described as brave and revelatory. And there, is a, there are a couple of moments in the book that are very poignant. The level of stress for you, uh, you talk about in, in being in college and wanting to avoid a fencing uh, <laughs> program and practicing throwing yourself down the steps so that you could. So that I could say I had a real injury. Yeah, yes, well. exactly. Um, but more poignantly, um, was this idea that you considered or thought about suicide uh, quite a lot. And, and I wanted to know like, how the process by which you decided to write about that. All right. Um, one, you know, suicide is a very private matter. Um, but I decided I wanted to write about it for several reasons. The, easiest reason to state first, I think, is, and I am, well, is first the statement, then the qualification. Um, one of the stereotypes, interestingly enough, that black people contend with, or one of the sets of expectations, um, is you're, too, you're supposed to be too strong to be depressed, you know, to break down, to be, um, acknowledge any kind of unhappiness. That's certainly the way um, many, many black people are raised. You know, and don't, don't give way, to give way in any way to acknowledge defeat, grief, um, melancholy, depression, is to give the white man, to give white people the victory. Um, I grew up very much in that landscape, um, which, you know, really comes several, certainly it's totally forms in the 19th century, but it precedes that. Um, and I found it enormously um, burdensome as I moved into my life as a writer. I found when I spoke honestly to black friends of mine, again, particularly women that I saw it manifested in men, that they were often suffering the same from the same thing. And yet the business of therapy or counseling, that felt very ver forbidden. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so much of this book is about what in terms of the, you know, one's matriculation into it's adult, you know, blackness, um, you know, what's forbidden, what's accepted, you know, what, how do you, what's allowed, what room for improvisation is allowed? Um, you know, what's the relationship of each black individual to the group at large. 
So that's one reason I wanted to write openly about it, to help break that taboo. And I am finding um, many of my students, um, young people of color, blacks, but also Latins, um, South and East Asians, um, at Columbia are, they're writing about this kind of thing um, and responding to it also. It's, it's been a kind of big cultural social secret. Um, the other thing is, um, if you're writing a memoir, you do choose what material to leave out. Yes. But um, a real, the, living within the confines of and negotiating with um, depression, which is as much anger as it is grief, had been a very large part of my adult life. And it was just too much of a lie um, not to write about it. Mm -hmm. I see we have about five more minutes. So there's a question that I wanted to really get to, and it's about the quote for your mother. It's a very ah. strong quote. Um, and she says very early in the book. Yeah, my, this is also at my, my just place. My mother and my father are young married. Yes. It's 1943. They're at Fort Huachuca, the all black army fort. And my mother is writing, she's pregnant with my sister, she's only been married a couple of years, and she is writing a dear friend of hers. Yes, and she writes to her friend in the closing part of the letter, sometimes I almost forget that I am a Negro. That's something, huh? Talk about that right. statement and what, what that means to you. What precedes that is that she's, she is saying to her friend, you know, there's another friend of theirs is about, is engaged, and my mother is saying, please, you know, give her my best and tell her I wish her all the happiness I have. In fact, I have so much happiness now that sometimes I almost forget I'm a Negro and that's something. Um, huh? I found that letter, or my mother found it and showed it to me in the 70s, and I read it out loud um, in our kitchen to my sister and my then quite young niece, and we, our jaws dropped. It was so poignant. My mother had always been very meticulous about what in terms of racial, we could see her anger at times, but racial grief, you know, that sense of, of helplessness at times. Um, she was, no, we, we did not see. Um, so to read this and realize that, you know, the, the rest of the letter is about movies she's seeing right. and sorority doings and clothes and books and, and to see suddenly in that line all of the pressures, you know, that she had lived with, she and every other black person coming of age, you know, had lived with. Um, and yet to see that she was a full, charming and lovely person that had seized, that she, that, that she had seized all of these things that you can take for granted, um, from falling in love with someone to loving seeing the movie Jane Eyre. Um, she had claimed those for herself, even though in some way we as black people didn't quite have license yes, to those pleasures. Hidden. That's what she, I see that sentence as, as meaning. Yeah, I read it as she had found a way to be fully human Yeah, in a world that one of the things that racism does is it denies humanity. Exactly. And your total humanity. And it can force you to feel it's a crime never to forget. Yes. And she was saying, I can do both. She, <laughs> I can yeah. remember and forget, yeah. So you mentioned your niece. How did you help her? navigate this world as she was growing up? Well, I followed my sister's lead. Um, <laughs> of course, um, you have to be careful as an aunt or uncle, <laughs> as I'm sure some of you know. Um, again, I think what we both tried to do, what I was most aware of was she wanted to dance, she was musical, uh, try, really encouraging everything in her temperament and personality that signaled flourishing. Mm -hmm. You know, and to give her a sense, I always had her keeping a little notebook, um, not because she was going to become a writer necessarily, but because as a girl also, I wanted her to feel her thoughts mattered, you know, mm -hmm. that she could have observations about anything. Um, in terms of race, we tried to follow the James Weldon Johnson 
lead. Um, she took ballet lessons very early, and so my sister really had to navigate between, you know, encouraging um, the, the hard work and the discipline and the pleasure that if you love ballet, it can give you nevertheless, and the fact that it was a very, very white world. My niece it all eventually danced with the Frankfurt Ballet and the Dance Theater of Harlem, um, but she's 46 now. You know, there would not have been room for her in ballet theater, as there is now for wonderful Misty Cope. Right. So. Yes, right, yes. Do you think white America, this is something that my friends and I debate so often, it's just like, do you think white Americans think about race as much as African Americans think about race? Do they even think about us as much as we think about them? Uh, um, well, <laughs> maybe some of you can answer that yeah, too. Yes, yeah, maybe you should. <laughs> um, you know, it depends on the white American, right? <laughs> Doesn't it? She said, um, I would say, what, you know, this is not something new. One of the privileges of being. Um, of, be, of taking your identity and status for granted is not having to think about the, um, the complexities, the contradictions, the difficulties of it all the time. One of the reasons we are seeing this venomous um, backlash of racism going in multiple directions, you know, is that certain groups of white people are finding that they're, when they think about their identity, they are thinking about challenge, deprivation, you know, not getting what they used to, you know, it's all being rattled up. Um, but I think traditionally, um, white people have been able to choose much more when they wanted or needed to think. Mm. Um, or were interested in, or even in terms of certain social forces, had to think about it. Then, you know, if you lived in an all-white neighborhood, you could close down. You could, you know, I think it's becoming harder now. I'm sure the Obama presidency has also made it. I think it was an issue. <laughs> it was galvanizing in, in good and very bad ways. It brought a lot of stuff racially that could be suppressed or confined way bubbling up, for sure. So I want to go back to your mother's quote okay. and, and the freedom that she found um, and the totality of her humanity that she found. I'd like to get free <laughs> like that. And I wonder how you feel about your life now. Do you feel that, free, that freedom that she expressed? I, well, I, first of all, she didn't feel it all the time. Okay. But she still um, had, a, had a joie de vivre. You know, that mm -hmm. um, I feel this is, no, I don't know. She also had a much more deliberately, she lived the life of an intelligent, um, upper middle class wife in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And that meant a certain kind of security albeit with difficulties, as we feminists know. Um, that was a life that you could structure in certain ways to be pretty safe. And if you were very resourceful about it, as she was, that pretty much worked. Um, my generation, and thank God, um, we were shaped by um, civil rights, black power, anti-war, feminism, women's movement, gay rights, you know, you, boom. <laughs> um, the, the excitement and the pleasure, the story of life, you know, the sense of freedom was supposed to partly come from this conflicts and feeling you had to be made new. Um, it's very scary sometimes. I think often it does leave one more fractured and fractious um, and open to uncertainties and unhappinesses. Um, uh, it's also, you know, it's all, it also kind of, kind of thrilling. It's pretty thrilling and it was essential. It was just utterly necessary. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for different kinds of freedom, aren't right. we? Yeah. 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 All right, well, we have to go to questions from the audience. Um, <laughs> you too, yeah. So, smile when you're asking your questions and remember you're going to be on camera. Uh, but before I call on the first person, I'd like to just take um, a little personal privilege, shamelessly so,
first of all, the Washington Post is a sponsor of um, the book festival. And uh, you know, for the last 16 years, since it's been organized, we've been a part of it. Uh, and I'd also just to say in terms, if you haven't seen this magazine, which was in last Sunday's paper, it's a commemorative issue <laughs> for the Museum of African American History and Culture. John Lewis is in it, Oprah Winfrey is in it, uh, Ken Burns is in it, uh, so many features. And I wrote the cover story. I said it was going to be shameless. So <laughs> get your hands on it. <laughs> so we've got about 20, excellent. We've got about 20, 20 minutes for questions. So I see a gentleman here at the mic. You, yes, you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your book. I thoroughly enjoyed it as much as reading your criticisms in the New York Times. Thank you. And I missed that. But there was something that I, I kind of felt. In the first part of your book, when you talked about being at the lab school and having very bourgeois, protective parents, did you ever get a chance to go down to the hood and make relationships there? And what kind of empathy and, and, and uh, identification did you make with the people on the other side of Chicago? I didn't quite get that as much as I got what was happening at the lab school in terms of your relationships. Well, that was my school. But I lived until, we lived in um, Park Manor, which was an all-black neighborhood, except for the very first years we moved into it. Um, in, until I was in high school. And so really everyone I was around um, was black. Um, I do mention, you know, in a sheltered way, going into certain parts of the hood, um, 47th and South Park, 63rd. Um, and I say, there's a story I tell um, where I say to my mother, oh my God, you know, I, I love being here, you know, the way people you know, the way black people are moving and talking. This, did you ever have that feeling about some special part of Chicago? And she said, yeah, exactly. Um, my parents were, my mother grew up in Chicago, so she was going to, you know, the Club de Lisa and the Regal Theater and all of that. I did that with my friends too. Um, my parents went to jazz clubs. Um, you know, all of their friends were black. My father was a pediatrician. He had patients from all classes. But I can't pretend that, um, I won't pretend that we made lots of friends um, across those class lines. We did not. Um, but we did live um, in an all-black neighborhood. And, um, you know, I was more, most familiar in terms of that day-to-day -day life with, with blacks. But no, those class lines were certainly there. And in a certain way, you know, in, ter we, you know, in terms of the, the black music we loved and, and um, black language, we were slumming a little bit when we tried to imitate it. We loved imitating it, but you know, we, were, we were playing exotic a little bit. That's what class um, distinctions do. Thank you. And I wanted to be very honest about that. Hi, Ms. Jefferson. I just had a question about um, one part of the book. What I thought was really heart-wrenching was um, the moment, like, you, you were a kid and you were playing with these white children and you didn't realize that they were kind of playing like a racist joke on you. And it was kind of the heartbreaking moment when, as a parent when you have to explain to your kids that what was happening to them was wrong and that oh, they should you, be offended. You mean the little girl next door to my grandmother, the one remaining white person on the block who yes. said, let's play Eyes from the Jungle yes. and started to swing her arms? Yeah, I had, thank God she was the only one. No, my grandmother called me in. Um, Margo, would you come in the house, please? And then she said, you know, do you know what she was doing? She was imitating um, a monkey. She was saying black people are monkeys. I had no idea. I think I was not allowed to watch. We were very, our parents were scrupulous about how much TV, all parents in the 50s were. I don't think we were allowed to watch certain cartoons and such where blacks would be regularly depicted as monkeys. That, at the age of nine or so, was just not a stereotype I knew. And I guess my question was just. And it, I, it was excruciating because I was mortified and angered by the girl, but I was mortified to have done something so shameful in front of my grandmother. 
Exactly. So um, having experienced kind of similar things, I guess my question would just be how does that kind of affect you as a kid, how you see yourself once you realize that people your own age are, you know, kind of internalizing these stereotypes and projecting them onto you, I guess. I think it's very scary. Um, and I think what one does, you veer between suppressing it, you know, and trying to deal with all of the, again, I was at a largely white school. There were a little cluster of we black people there, but I went to school every day with white kids. So I had to suppress that enough to have my everyday relationships with kids who were not doing that. On the other hand, you have to retain that somewhere in your consciousness so that you'll be wary. Um, you'll avoid a situation where it might happen again. You'll know how to act more boldly and bravely if it happens again. So Thank you, you, yeah. Yeah, you veer between burying it and using it. Sir, with the nice um, Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> yes, I, uh, I read your book. I, I uh, liked it a lot. Um, I can see that the black experience, which I have not had, is, I'm sorry. I, I say I can see that the black experience, which I have not had, is certainly another layer of complexity. But I also had the feeling that, you know, young white kids are also learning to be grown up and learning to be white, and, and they don't know the rules, and they feel the same sort of mortification when they use the wrong word or, you know, do something embarrassing. And I wonder how much of your experience was just growing up, which is difficult for anybody. You know, it's hard to quantify. Um, there is a certain kind of childhood and especially adolescent experience that, yes, we are all clumsy, we all make mistakes, we all yearn desperately to be accepted, we all struggle with rejection. Um, the fact is, um, I had, as a black person, you know, the, the, the racialized I rather than, you know, the oh poor me, um, intimate I, um, any young black child had an additional level, layer, call it what you want, of pure race consciousness that could express itself in anything from um, innocent mistakes, maybe something you picked up from a grandparent, you didn't know what it meant, to um, bigotry, open bigotry, um, you know, to, you know, whatever, to, you know, just getting along fine. I don't think that, that I know, that level of racial wariness and watchfulness was just, it wasn't there if you were a white person. Unless you were a white, very conscious white person in a largely black setting. That would be a different situation. Okay, I see two questions here. Um, I uh, just wanted to ask about, um, in particular, the way in which you see the Negro land of 2016. And I ask this from the position of teaching at a pretty well-to-do independent school in Washington, D.C., where the consumption of black cultures is now very much central to the way in which we operate. That's part of what's happening even in our political landscape, yeah. that black cultures are being consumed more readily by more people um, and being digested, whether consciously or unconsciously. Absolutely. Um, oftentimes, and I'm just wondering, in looking at that consumptuous, that conspicuous consumption, looking at it, do you see the Negro land shifting in 2016, these Negro lands? Are those spaces having to adapt and to adjust oh, to the God. way in which the, the, the cultural landscape is moving and those new tensions that are being created? Absolutely. First of all, it's, it's been having to adjust. Just within my lifetime, it started to have to adjust you know, with these upheavals of the 60s um, and 70s, absolutely. Um, and the upheaval even included certain kinds of more intense integration. Now I think you're talking about this mass cultural consumption, is that right? Mm -hmm. Just, yeah, you bet. Um, it means for, among many things, that Negro landers, that the so-called black elite um, has to acknowledge, respect, be, fluent 
in many more kinds of black culture than they, than they once had to, and that is only a good thing. Yeah, but, I, yeah. I think I asked that because I was just at a dance with the kids and I noticed how much you trap. You think what? I was at a dance, like chaperoning the dance with the kids, and they're so into like trap music now and like all these new things that I think are like very different than like would have been 15 years ago and like that's like all the kids like were consuming it and I'm like black culture is much more central now and I'm wondering how does that affect it when you oh. talk about black culture and black wealth? Okay. You know I think it you know I think back actually to people first talking about the effect of the Jackson 5. Um, that sense whether you like all of it um, or not of being unquestionably at the center of the culture is a very different thing. In a way, that's akin, though, you know, less controlled to what we were saying at the beginning about the um, Museum of African American History in the center of this nation. No one can deny whether it's, you know, on the pages of a magazine or newspaper or, you know, on your computer that black culture in every way, from rap to books to TV shows to zines, is absolutely central to this thing we call American culture. That gives you um, a very different sense of yourself. It means you're not a footnote um, or only a problem or a kind of supplicant um, or the forced, forced to be always um, the rebel. You can still be all of those things, but you don't have to be a supplicant or a footnote anymore. So let's do our, we've got time for one question. One more question. I see the gentleman there. Hi. Uh, this may or may not be related to what you were talking about, uh, but you said something about, or one of the things is being cognizant of uh, the black experience and different from like white or how much do you think about these things? Um, and I was wondering if or like that, uh, that relates to other uh, things uh, that are like, uh, did you happen to, or did you come across how it may be related to thinking about um, I don't know, being disabled versus not being disabled? Yeah, I could, I could see an analogy there, absolutely. If you are not, to use your phrasing, if you are disabled, you have to constantly compare yourself to what is declared the societal norm, which is not being disabled. If you are not disabled, you have much more room to take yourself for granted. Um, it would also seem to me that one of the other things that would be analogous would be the sense constantly of self-consciousness. How are you being viewed um, by this other world, be it um, the normal world of white people or the normal world of men often or the normal world of the abled, the not disabled. So, yeah, um, I, I definitely see a consciousness analogy there. Thank you for your question. Thank you all for your questions. And thank you, Ms. Jefferson. Thank you, Marcia Davis. Thank you. It's a great book fair. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.